A população e o PIB mundial crescem World population and GDP grow constantly, improving income and consumption capacity. The need for food, energy and clothing accelerate along with our growth. Brazil is a key part for ag production on the planet. Throughout its history, SLC Agricola has been decisively contributing to meet that growing demand. With the production of grains, seeds, fibers, and cattle production, turned into food and fabric, SLC Agricola has always done more with less. The drive for positive transformation is what moves us, translating the passion for what we do. The SLC Group, the founder of SLC Agricola, is a pioneer in the manufacturing of ag machines in the country. It produced the first self-propelled combine in 1964. In the late 90s, it sold the machine plant, dedicating strongly to large-scale agriculture in the Cerrado, using the best experience management practices. SLC Agricola produces grains, fibers, and seeds in strategically positioned units in the Brazilian Cerrado. Besides working on cattle production through crop and livestock farming, the flat topography and the rainfall in that biome are ideal for high scale and high yielding agriculture. We are one of the largest national producers of soybean, corn, and cotton. We work with a standardized and replicable model with advanced cost control and risk management practices. Management at L SLC Agricola is efficient in production planning and it's supported by extensive agronomic research and the use of precision farming. Innovation revolutionizes egg production across the globe and SLC invests strongly in digital transformation on the farm. These activities along with good corporate governance practices generate sustainable results for SLC Agricola, placing it among the most profitable companies in the industry. The efficient use of technologies and good farming practices allow the company to have two crops a year. At every harvest, yield limits are tested, breaking yield records. SLC Agricola was one of the first companies in the industry to go public, trading its share at the stock exchange. The company is a world reference in traceability and certified production. Working using the principles of social and environmental responsibility, meeting new demands preserving natural resources are sustainability commitments the company has. Creating standardized batches and quality control, the company developed an exclusive system allowing for direct sales to the textile industry across the globe. Building long lasting relationships with our customers valuing our employees, giving them career opportunities, life quality, and digital training are our ideals at SLC, to train people to evolve technologically, to produce efficiently and responsibly while preserving the planet. That's how we will help build a sustainable future 
for future generations. Our big dream is to positively impact future generations, being a world leader in ag efficiency and respect for the planet. We are SLC Agricola. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this public meeting we hold annually at SLC Agricola. This year, we bring the topic, the best in agriculture. I'm Rodrigo Jalain, financial manager and investors relations manager at SLC, and will be your host. But before we continue, I would like to reinforce that in our studios, we are strictly complying with all safety protocols set forth by the authorities. For the opening remarks of our event, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Eduardo Logman, the chairman of the board at SLC Agricola. Good afternoon, Eduardo. The stage is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the SLC annual meeting. It's a pleasure for me to address you, shareholders, investors, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone watching us today. For us to get to the results we achieved in the 2021 season, record numbers, more than 4 million rails. We had a long history, and I want to share a bit of that story with you. My grandfather, Frederico George Logman, arrived in Brazil in the early 1900s. And in 1945, almost 77 years ago, he founded Schneider Logman, that today became the SLC Group. He began with a small plant of um, ag implements. We had a mill for wheat and corn, and we grow some. We grew in Brazilian agriculture. The Logman family today, the controller of SLC Agricola and SLC Machines, the main two companies of the SLC Group, we created the first self-propelled combine in Brazil at the time. The Brazilian combine market were 13 machines. We produced one and imported 12. The egg market grew with soybeans, with corn, with wheat. Cotton arrived in the late 70s, early 80s, and SLC has always been present. Another very important landmark was in 1977 with uh, the establishment of SLC Agricola, a company from the Schneider Logman Group today, SLC, was had a spin-off to dedicate to the production of grains at the time. So it was founded in Horizontina, and in the year 2000s, it moved to Porto Alegre, where we have our current headquarters. And that's how SLC grew. We began with a little more than 5,000 hectares. Uh, hectares and when we went public we were one of the first egg companies to go public in brazil we already planted 117,000 hectares of soybean corn cotton wheat and some other grains at a lower scale when we decided to go public in 2007 that was key for the growth of slc agricola a very fast growth I should say, today we are present in seven Brazilian states, 22 production units. Our headquarters are still in Porto Alegre, one of the largest, but perhaps the best producer of grain and fibers in Brazil. Very high yield. Our innovation center is diversifying and growing. We are investing heavily to become increasingly more modern. During the pandemic, so that you understand, we grew 46% with the acquisition of Terra Santa and the inclusion of the Xingu area, 675,000 hectares. And we are proudly one of the best grain and fiber producers in the country. So SLC achieved the record results 
we just saw yesterday at our board meeting and today with the posting of our results to our shareholders, the press, consultants, and analysts. These are my initial remarks for this event. I hope you enjoy it. You will learn more about our company and enjoy this afternoon. We're gonna have a Q&A session after the presentations of our directors. Thank you very much. And I turn it back to our host. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for your message. I would like to say that in the studio, I have Aurelio Pavinato, the CEO of SLC, Ivo Broom, CFO and Investors Relations Director, Alvaro Dili, HR Sustainability and IT Director, and Federico Logman, our Innovation and Strategic Planning Head a very important team in line with the importance of our guests. As you know, the topic of our meeting is the best in agriculture. Besides presenting our results, we will talk about relevant topics like strategies, the fertilizer and commodities market objectives, deliveries in innovation, ESG, and what we can expect for the future. After presentations, we will have a second moment during which we will answer questions that can be sent through our WhatsApp number, through the QR code you can see on the screen, or directly online for those watching us via Zoom. Well, I would like to start with our presentations and I turn it over to Pavinato. Good afternoon, Pavinato. Over to you, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, all our investors, analysts, everyone watching us today, a very important day to us where we are announcing last year's results. You saw and will see that these were extraordinary results, but most importantly, we want to show you how prepared we are for the future you know that investors do not count on the past, they count on the future. And SLC has an ability to deliver increasingly better results. That's why our agenda, I will cover strategy first of all, then a bit about the market. I will talk about commodity prices and also about fertilizer prices. And Federico will speak about innovation. He's our innovation head. Alvaro will talk about ESG. And Ivo will conclude our presentations with our economic and financial results. And I'll come back to speak about our future. On the strategic side, this screen summarizes the history and the evolution of SLC. Mr. Logman mentioned when the company began, but the first 30 years of SLC Agricola were years of focus on real estate investment in the new ag frontier. After that, phase number two in SLC Agricola was post IPO, buying more land, modernizing our management, and phase number three. And that's the one we want to talk about a lot today. And there are four pillars that guide our activities in this third phase of the company. I will speak about the first two, growth and efficiency of our operation, and then our colleagues will speak about the other two pillars, financial solidity and protagonism in ESG. And uh, our strong presence in ESG is not by chance. We have a history on that topic. Ever since I graduated and came to the company to create the Ag Planning Department for us to develop a sustainable production system within our farms. 
asset like growth, going into the first topic of our presentation, the asset like growth, we have managed to deliver that growth. And the graph speaks for itself, showing our evolution in the 2021 2022 season, where we grew 46% in our planted area through two acquisitions I will discuss. So the graph shows the stable acreage in our own area and our growth through leases and partnerships. On the next graph, I'll go into efficiency. Why? Today, we have a mature portfolio, 99% of our land is mature. And that's why yield indicators show that we have reached results above Brazilian averages, showing how competitive the company is. If you produce commodities, you have two possibilities. Either you increase yields or you reduce production cost so that you rise above the pack and you increase your profitability and return to shareholders. Mature portfolio, focus on the second crop, maximization and asset use. We have 50% of our, of the land where we operate, we can have a second crop, but we are intensifying that as much as we can through soybeans and then cotton and corn, and we are now entering more strongly in crop and livestock farming, as we call the third crop. First, we plant soybeans, then corn, brachiaria, and after that, you have the cattle grazing return, a higher return per hectare, higher than what we had before when we just planted one crop a year. Now I'd like to show you the cases and the deliveries we had over the past few years. The major 2021 project was the acquisition of Terra Santa with a mature portfolio in a very noble area in Brazil, in the state of Mato Grosso, a project and a long-term 20-year contract where we will operate that land, an, an appropriate capital structure, fiscal credit present in that area. So it is a project that we adopted that fortunately is generating a lot of value to SLC Agricola and fortunately a lot of value to the shareholders from Terra Santa. It's still a real estate company leasing land to SLC Agricola. The second project we had in 2021 was the acquisition of Agricola Shingu, a partnership we have with Mitsui. We have we've had a partnership with Mitsui since 2013. In two other farms, that partnership continues. However, those two farms that Mitsui operated by its own were leased to us. 45,000 hectares of planted area, a 15 year old contract in Bahia, a 10 year old, a 10 year uh, contract in Goiás with mature land. And the data of the current crop shows that. We are concluding soybean harvest in 2022 and our challenge in the 2021, 22 season was to deliver that 45% growth while maintaining efficient operations. The soybean yield we are announcing today is proof of that. Our average is similar to last year's average throughout the company. Over 66 bags of soybean per hectare, confirming our theory that this expansion into mature area will maintain the efficiency of our operation, but above all, efficiency in execution. It's not enough to have mature area. If you do not have execution efficiency, you can't deliver excellent results. And we are delivering in 21, 22 season, we are delivering 
as good re results or even better than last year's results that you will see for the 2021 figures. The third success story is the seed production project. We produce soybean grains, we produce cotton seeds, and we have two choices. And it can be either consumed as grains or it can be used as seeds. And we are converting grains into seeds. And in the current season, we are delivering 761,000 hectares of soybeans, or bags, not hectares, of soybean seeds, 85,000 bags of cotton seeds, this is a project that we began four years ago and is evolving extraordinarily, adding value and generating more results in the same asset, namely land. That seed project is totally asset light because we have a seed processing unit in Goiás and in Bahia. Both of them are contracted out. And now I'd like to speak about the next project that will take place in Mato Grosso. I would just like to reinforce the important pillars of the seed production project, people, processes, technology, and the support structure and the synergy we can generate. Seed production, SLC Agricola, generates a lot of synergies to the grain production that we have. That's why it's a project that adds value. We measure how much seed production is adding value-wise to our shareholders over the years. Although as a company, it's within the same company, it's just a different brand, SLC seeds or cementes, but it does generate additional value. And that's totally connected with our asset-like growth. This is another project to hey today we can produce up to 1.3 million bags of seeds in the original projects in Goiás, Bahia, and now in Minas Gerais, another seed processing unit we contracted out. Even in Tocantins, we produce seeds in between the crop seasons. We have a potential of 1.3 million bags of soybean seeds. We signed an agreement with one of our partners it's not a partnership project, a partner that will invest in a seed processing unit, the most modern in Latin America, in the Payaguas farm we have in Mato Grosso. Coat Logistica is an exemplary company in terms of logistics and storage. They will build a refrigerated seed processing unit and we will commission their services with a capacity of over 1 million soybean seed bags. It has become a large business within SLC Agricola, generating value and generating value to the company, to the shareholders. Cattle production is here to supplement our operations. We have cattle production in different systems. We have marginal areas. Every farm has more sandy soil. So we are planting pasture and managing cattle there. We also have areas where we plant soybeans where we can have a second crop using corn or cotton. So we plant brachiaria where the cattle will graze and also areas where we grow soybeans, corn, brachiaria in the middle of the corn, and then cattle can graze on that land. So that's one more way to generate results in the same land we have maximizing our production system. Once again, that maximization of our production system is very important to generate results to the company and value to shareholders, but it's very important sustainability wise. We must produce more food, more fiber, while using the same natural resources that are finite and scarce. scarce. That's why we must intensify our production system, generating more products by hectare. I always compare 
our production system in Brazil with the one in other countries. We are able to produce six to seven tons per hectare as compared to the world that on average only produces 3.5 tons of grains per year. There are some cases, an internal benchmark, where we produce five tons of soybeans and another 10 tons of corn. So we are producing 15 tons per hectare of land because of the intensive use of uh, natural resources. All right, that's a bit of our deliveries in our asset-like growth, in terms of the efficiency in our operations. I mentioned that we are concluding harvesting the soybeans. We've already planted cotton with high yield potential. Today, we planted double crop cotton during the right window last year. You must remember that we had to delay planting cotton, just like corn last year, we planted corn late in March. This year we planted corn in February. So cotton and corn have been planted and they show high yield potential. You remember that last year we had drought in Mato Grosso do Sul and it didn't rain as much in Mato Grosso this year normal weather is expected. That's why in 2022, we grew 46%. Our soybean yield was similar to what we had last year. And our expectation is that for cotton, we will have higher yields this year compared to last year. And in corn, yield will be higher because we managed to plant corn at the right time. Last year, planting was delayed. Let me speak a little about the market now. I will talk about commodity prices, soybean, corn, and cotton, and also the price of our main input, fertilizers. And unfortunately, there are challenges ahead. But first, let me show you the weather pattern in Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay this last season. This map shows the rainfall in January in Brazil. I do not have the map for Argentina and Paraguay, but how much it rained in Southern Brazil was what it rained in Paraguay and Northern Argentina. We had a significant rain deficit in Argentina in Southern Brazil and excessive rain in Mato Grosso causing a few issues, but it didn't affect our yield significantly. That's why we delivered excellent results. In February, we had almost the same thing. It didn't rain in mid-South Brazil. It rained a little more in Mato Grosso, disturbing our harvest. We harvested 66, eight. We could have harvested 68, 69 bags per hectare. Hadn't it been for excessive rain, but Lower rainfall in Southern Brazil, Paraguay and Argentina led to crop failure in soybeans in Latin America, affecting the world supply in over 30 million tons of soybeans that were not produced in Southern Brazil, Paraguay and Argentina. So what happened to prices? So you see here the map of the United States, the forecast is that May, June and July, which is their season there, that there's going to be low rainfall in some regions and too much rainfall in other regions. So you have to pay attention to that. The soybean, corn and cotton supply in the world today is limited. The, the All the stocks are low. So if there's any climate problem in the United States and Northern Hemisphere that will lead to any reduction of production as to what was estimated early on will be a factor for a price rally. So the traditional weather market this year is expected to be even more intense this year because global stocks are low. The soybean price, just look at the soybean prices today. $17 per bushel. So 
very high prices because of uh, low supply. So this is why I have higher prices. If you look at estimations for next year, $14. It's not as high as prices today, but still high prices, $14 per bushel. Looking at soybean supply and demand, what draws your attention here is uh, the higher, the demand is higher than supply. In the past three years, there were two years in which demand was much higher than supply. So that's why prices are high. So what is the market saying to Brazilian and global producers or growers? Well, plant more, we need more soybeans, our stocks are low. So this is the message that the market is telling us today. So this is why in, in Brazil, Brazilian growers are expanding their production area, trying to meet international demand. And corn, bean, corn and soybean are always hand in hand, the, and corn prices are up, and the war in Ukraine has increased prices even further because Ukraine is an important corn supplier in the world, and with the war there, the logistics for corn exports, the, the corn that was already harvested, but will not be sent to other countries. And they should start planting in April. So we don't know if Ukrainians will be able to plant corn this year. And it's it's likely that they won't. So there is an expect, expectations of lower supply and uh, higher prices. So irrespective of the war in Ukraine, just look at this graph this year with the drought in, the, in Southern Brazil, we don't produce so much corn in, in that season. That's why our production was not that affected. Our important corn production is in Brazil is in second seasons, or, but we had three or four years actually in a row where supply was lower than demand. That's why there's such pressure on prices. And today we see high soybean prices, high corn prices, and the other commodities go together. They follow suit in the case of cotton. What is cotton? Why is cotton related to soybean and corn? Because there's competition for area in the United States, for instance. So if there's high soybean and corn prices, Americans will plant more soybeans and corn and less cotton. The same in China. In China, they grow cotton because in the Xinjiang region, there are government subsidies. But in the Midwest of uh, China, where there's no cotton subsidies, growers are planting rice, soybean, and uh, corn. And this also puts a pressure on cotton prices. And this is why for the second year in a row, if you look at the five years, there was the pandemic where cotton demand was lower and then supply was higher than demand. And in the other four years, we see that the supply was lower than demand, and then we see 120 cents per pound cut, and the futures, future prices are lower, but the expectation is that there's going to be a balance between soybean, cotton, and corn prices. And because of that, cotton prices will be higher than uh, historical prices. And this is going to be very profitable for Brazilian growers who grow cotton with very high yield and quality. Fertilizers. Well, fertilizers is the big challenge today for season 2021-2022. We, we are harvesting now, so we already bought the input and the price was already paid for and therefore our production cost in 2021-22 season is being managed. But prices are up now and the expectation is that our margins in 2022 will be similar or or better than those in 2021. But we see here fertilizer prices and uh, this is a graph that concerns us uh, concerns us if we look at 2022-23 season. We've bought nearly half of the fertilizers we need and uh, we bought potassium, which is the product that Russia and uh, Yellow Russia mostly supply to the world. 40% of global exports come from those two countries. We have already 
but 83% of our potassium. So today we do not depend so much on uh, Russia and Belarusia. And that's why our expectation is that we will have uh, supplies for the next season. Now, prices are high, of course, 50% that we bought, we bought at lower or proper prices, let's say. So what has not been acquired yet, we don't know what price we have to be paid. Prices are high today. Nitrogen, for instance, its price was going down, but then with the war prices, nitrogen prices are back to a very high level. Potassium and phosphorus are at a very high level. And because there's war and tension. So what will happen to prices depend on what happens in the war. We know that historically fertilizer prices don't remain at a very high level for a long time. So expectations is that over time, prices will be adjusted, but irrespective of that, what is our vision for 2023? Higher fertilizer prices, higher costs, but also higher commodity prices as well. So we expect to have good margins in 2023. So that's the first part of my presentation and uh, thank you for your attention. Now I'd like to turn it over to Federico Logeman, innovation head, and he's going to be telling us about innovation initiatives, which are fully aligned with our strategy to maximize operational efficiency. Thank you, Pavinato. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to the financial market now as a head for innovation and strategy as well. When we talk about innovation at SLC, I think the important point to frame in this discussion is to say what we want with innovation at SLC. Our innovation mission is based on the connection between strategy as you saw in Pavinato's update, and the model of three innovation horizons. Today, our innovation ambition is linked to horizon one, which is using technologies to support the business as it is today. Last year, we expanded that scope and linked into horizon, horizon two where our ambition is to renew the business with a long-term view. Over the past few years at SLC Agricola, we've established some teams and programs to speed up the company's digital transformation, speed up the adoption of new technologies, and also adopt a culture for cooperation and an agile culture. So in this slide, we see a summary of the programs that were introduced in the past few years, and I'll go into more details of each one of them now. In 2021, we established the new department, the innovation department, and uh, we see in the slide how it connects to the other teams and, and departments in the company. So indeed today we, we have an internal ecosystem and also an external ecosystem, including number initiatives at different levels of maturity. So this is the model that we've designed and we think it's been very successful so much so that we've been increasing the number of initiatives. So I'll give you some updates on, on some concrete deliveries we had. And every time we talk about innovation and uh, digital ag, the first step, of course, is connectivity. We've uh, been giving the market updates regarding that. Today, there are 16 farms with uh, completely connected fields with 4G, most of them, and one of them with 5G coverage and the business is being growing a lot. So we are trying to connect every new farm that uh, that 
that's been acquired. So we will be able then to enjoy all of the benefits of digital agriculture. These are also figures that uh, we've been sharing with the market. We see that here the benefit we've been trying to get from new technologies. So here we see basically three groups of new technologies. And in the last season, we had 25 million real savings because of them. And the goal this year is that this, is, this benefit is going to be doubled, a net benefit of 50 million reals. These technologies, well, five or four years, five or four years ago, we we're learning how to use them and to master them. Today, we are scaling their use up in the company. The Digital Lab is our software factory. I won't be able to go into the details of each one of the delivery here, deliveries here, but it's a, an organization that develops software for our use. And some of these initiatives were based on the innovation programs that we have. And some of them are older than that. And then they've been updated every year. And this is the innovation organization that was established last year that works based on um, four pillars. There's an entrepreneurship program called Ideas and Results, and there is a Startup Connection program, it's called Agra Exponential, and then there's LCC Ventures, established last year, which is our investment vehicle with a mid and long-term vision. So we've been increasing the number of innovation initiatives and we started to work with an idea of an innovation portfolio. We jokingly say that this is the nursery of the innovation initiatives in the company. Every technology we use today is started as an idea when, and, and a prototype and then they were scaled up and uh, today we enjoy the benefits. Today, there are 44 initiatives that are beginning and uh, that are managed by the innovation group. Last year, we performed 39 proofs of con uh, concepts, trying to validate hypotheses, uh, and uh, we did roll out of those solutions in the company. So these are some examples of the last year's rollouts. So initiatives in different areas, for instance, sustainability, sales, mechanization. So teams met last year and worked together to understand the new technology and then prototype ideas. And then uh, Eventually, the technology was rolled out last year. And finally, SLC Ventures was the latest organization that we established. We started to analyze different in investment alternatives last year and also working with as a venture builder. We have two projects underway. They're at, at uh, initial stages but we will update the market as they become more important. So we are here sowing some seeds, some business seeds that can be important in the future. Also, we're trying to promote synergies between the different initiatives. Uh, the venture, one of the venture builder projects was born in the ideas and results program. So we are now giving it seed capital to turn it into a business. And also we are assessing investments in some of the companies that came from the agro exponential program. So it's important to look at the picture as a whole because then things make more sense because we can find synergies between the different projects and initiatives. So I spoke about the different initiatives and groups in the company. And last year also, we came up with the idea of designing a new brand. And it's an honor for me to introduce this new brand to you. It's Horizonte SLC, representing 
the innovation drive of the company. So this is the innovation brand of SLC Agricola. We will now watch a video and uh, it will explain what Horizonte SLC is. So let's watch the video. When you look to the horizon, you see possibilities of sowing new seeds, opening your new paths and writing your own ideas, being protagonists of a more fertile, potent and thriving future. So the, this is SLC, Horizonte, Horizonte SLC, because we believe we can have a positive impact for future generations by being global leaders in agriculture efficiency and respecting the planet. So this is our man manifest of curiosity, bravery and innovation. We connect knowledge, ideas and technologies to inspire the development of new solutions for SLC's daily challenges. To start new businesses that will lead to the evolution of agribusiness. After all, to feed and dress people and the dreams that move the world, you need to be always moving and challenge yourself, reinvent yourself and open the doors to new opportunities, new challenges, new partnerships and new meanings to make sure that our impact in the world will be something we can be proud of and that we can celebrate Horizonte SLC. We plant the future today. So this video shows you what we want with this new brand. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone in the company and out the company that are helping us create the agriculture of the future. And we wanted to speed this process up with this new brand. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Alvaro, who's going to be telling you more about our ESG programs. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for having joined us in this meeting. I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about sustainability. Sustainability at, is, is in the DNA of SLC Agricola. We've always been very careful with our properties, with the, the production environment, and sustainability is being important for us for many years. And when we went public, we've defined some parameters and a journey for 2008, 2009, and the company then had the following thinking, the future of agriculture is certified agriculture, is traceable agriculture. So back then, this vision guided us into the future, being protagonists of the future. And the sustainability today has its specific agenda, the ESG agenda. But at that time, we would jokingly say that sustainability was not something exoteric, you needed to be able to measure it and develop it. And sustainability was included in the company's strategy. We wanted to be able to use sustainability and create value for the company's investors and shareholders. And the evolution of that is ESG, but before that we became signatories to the to the UN's global compact in Brazil with uh, and also the business principles in 2015 after that the COP15 in Paris gave us guidances for the improvement of our standards so sustainability has evolved since then and today the company is more robust and diligent so to speak So we know that the ESG agenda is very important for investors because it includes risk management, opportunity management. So I'd like to point out that in 2016, the company started to work with the sustainable development goals, trying to understand how the, how the UN 2030s agenda would make sense for a company in agribusiness such as 
uh, our case in 2018, we had a meeting with uh, our leaders in a two-day workshop because we were looking at the very ample sustainability scope. So we defined three paths that would be like the big themes, the big concerns important for the world, for Brazil, and for us. So climate and soil changes is one of them, water and biodiversity as well, and uh, stakeholder relationship. So this is all connected to, to the sustainable development goals. There are 17 goals, but I guess we have initiatives and programs for all of the 17 goals, but our priorities are objective number eight, for decent work, 12, for responsible production, 13, climate change and uh, scenarios of change and adaptation that the company needs to take into account for the future, and water, which is so important. And of course, the environment in general. So these are the three paths in which we've made progress. And the first materiality that we came up with was 2016, with a survey with many stakeholders and players. Based on that, we came up with 10 material themes. And, now in, and then in 2021, we updated this matrix. We once again talked to people, have more than 500 people who answered our surveys because we wanted to see if a change was required and it was. So we have now these in three areas of ESG in terms of environmental, we talk about climate change and environmental management systems. So this is a, what is being demanded from associate agricola and in the social field working on social and economic impact, people development, so training people, training our employees, and also citizen education. Diversity and inclusion is an important point that is important in every company today, and uh, we are not an exception. And uh, finally, quality of life, health, and safety. And then governance. As I mentioned today, certification, both for properties and for the most important products, and also traceability. And then second point, ethics and a code of conduct and a very good compliance group in the company today with awareness and training. More than 2,800 2, people were trained in compliance. Innovation, well, Federico already spoke about that. So everything leading to high performance, even ESG. Even if there's this idea of a risk management, we try to use that and improve our performance based on innovation that is intimately connected to sustainability. And risk management, which is the concern of investors because it's to do with the image and reputation of companies. How is our ESG governance? We we established an ESG committee late in 2020 with three of our board members. And Pavinato, the, C, the chairman, is part of the committee, and I am a member as well. So we look at the strategy for ESG, and at the same time, there is the sustainability organization in the company that in which you find environmental management, quality management, health and safety management, process management, and project management. Based on four international standards, ISO 14,000 for environmental management, ISO 45,001 that replaced 18,000 for health and safety, and NBR 16,001. These three standards were the basis of our management system. And later on, also, we included ISO 9001 for quality management and the company's strategy. Today, 
11 of our units are certified according to the system. It's, it's a very dynamic system. Every year we improve and we go beyond just complying with the legislation, which is already something very complex in Brazil. To give you an idea, we have to comply with more than thousands of laws, regulations, and standards in each one of our properties. And we have a robust software program that manages operating licenses and their requirements, and that they expire every two or three or four years, and then we do annual analysis, and all of that is third-party certified in the company. So we look at risks and impacts in, at every unit. Our mission and ambition is that all of our 22 sites will be part of this very complex system by 2026. And that's what we are working for right now. Let's look at some of the outcomes of all of that. In cotton and soybean, we certified sites and products, ABR and the Better, Better Cotton Initiative, which looks at the whole supply chain and supply and ABR is a Brazilian certification for Brazilian farms. So 100% of our cotton and lint is certified. So as I mentioned, 13 years ago, we knew that the future would be of certified agriculture. And we wanted to open our markets. We have companies that buy directly from or us because we have the BCI or the ABR certification. So it's important that we've been at the forefront. And in 2009, we were part of the, I was part of the board and we came up with the principles and criteria for a platform, the RTRS certification is implemented in 123,000 hectares for 2021 season with a, many thousands of tons of certified soybeans. It means that we can make sure that all of soybeans in those 123,000 hectares in those farms that are certified according to demand for credits, it means that there's zero deforestation since 2009 in those RTRS certified. So since 2009, we've had soybeans in our silos, which are free from deforestation. And uh, that generates financial credits. It's a little bit of, of value, but in 2021, in addition to having sold so soybean, et cetera, we also had 4 million and 500,000 reals by coming from RTR. nós a nossa ambição maior que é a redução dos gases de efeito estufa. Aqui nós estamos nos reduzir em 25% as nossas emissões com base em 2019 até 2030, coincidindo com a agenda da ONU, né, os ODS que ali estão colocando são ela se tornou muito maior com o fim do ciclo de conversão. A empresa não vai mais atuar em fronteiras agrícolas para transformação e abertura de áreas nativas, então ficou fechado esse ciclo em agosto de 2021. Para a alegria de todos nós, para a alegria da companhia, né? terminou então essa, essa fase e a gente está entrando no Asset Light como um processo mais consistente. E a gente não está, não é um chute que nós estamos dando nessa redução. Existem projetos uma meia dúzia de projetos que nós estamos conduzindo nessa linha para redução. Além de não abrir mais áreas, também utilizar o, as melhores práticas em agronomia, as melhores práticas de produção, plantio direto, rotação de cultura, que a gente vê para frente um pouquinho, 
né, o projeto de agricultura digital, que já traz alguns indicadores bem interessantes. Então, nós estamos no caminho certo e evoluindo. Todas as nossas uh, emissões, desde 2016, a gente protocola, isso é público, né, do GHG Protocol aqui no Brasil, vai lá, estão as nossas emissões. Não é um footprint, não é apenas uma pegada de carbono. E, assim, o nosso balanço de emissões e de compensação que temos na companhia. Uso de energia, reflorestamento, tudo isso faz parte dos nossos projetos. E ligando um pouquinho com tecnologia, não tem como falar em ESG sem tecnologia hoje em dia. E nós estamos assegurando que com aplicações localizadas, um fertilizante dirigido, com agricultura de precisão, a gente tem casos aí de sucesso de redução de até 90% desses insumos, né? inclusive redução de água que a gente vê para frente. Um outro exemplo é a nossa capacidade de utilização do segundo, do primeiro maior hoje, né, mas era o segundo maior emissor, que seriam os nitrogenados. A nossa capacidade de usar, é, a, a, na faixa ideal, o nitrogênio, cresceu na safra, né, de, de 2010 a 2013 era 59%, hoje a gente está utilizando 73%. Né, e não é para chegar a 100%, não se consegue isso, dada a volatilidade, desses é, insumos. Né? Mas melhoramos também, tanto na safra quanto na safrinha, essa utilização racional do nitrogênio, que é grande fator de gases de efeito estufa. Ao mesmo tempo, diesel, que é o segundo maior emissor que nós temos, a gente só consegue ver isso medindo, né? tendo essa, essa pegada, esse GHG protocolo, e a gente viu, ao longo dos anos, uma redução bem significativa de é, combustível por de diesel por hectare. Biofábricas, bioinsumos, são fatores importantes. Hoje a gente já tem isso é, produzindo on-farm né, na, na companhia e vai evoluindo né, para bioinsumos, para biomateriais, materiais. a pesquisa está avançando para tornar assim, os recursos mais adequados. Outros indicadores importantes aqui, na safra 2021, com a adoção da agricultura digital, que foi comentada até pelo Frederico anteriormente, pelo Pavinato também, redução do consumo de água, foram 25 milhões de litros a menos com a adoção de aplica onde é preciso apenas. Então, isso aqui é água evitável né, nas aplicações. Redução de volume dos insumos em quase 96 toneladas. A mesma coisa se fala de um dos resíduos sólidos de embalagens, a redução aí de mais de uma carreta, né? 34 toneladas de, de redução de embalagens. Isso são pontos importantes. Ainda falando de outro uh, eixo prioritário, que é água e biodiversidade, 84%, mais de 84% dos resíduos são destinados à reciclagem, num processo simples de 5S, de descarte adequado, e principalmente descarte para uh, clientes homologados que podem receber e dar o destino correto a cada um desses resíduos. Salientando que mais de 98% das nossas áreas são cultivadas em sistema de sequeiro e não exigem irrigação e utilização de água. E aonde exigem? Na Fazenda Pamplona, na Fazenda Palmares, principalmente, a gente, e a Fazenda Paissandu, a gente é, é, usa um sistema que tem um pouco de inteligência artificial e que demanda exatamente o que a cultura está precisando de água e não precisa estar lá chutando o chão e vendo se tem umidade para a lavoura. Basta olhar o sistema, ele automaticamente liga e desliga os sistemas e economiza muita água. E 100% dos nossos efluentes líquidos, que pouquíssimas cidades no Brasil têm, na, nas fazendas da SLC Agrícola, é tudo tratado. Os efluentes líquidos são tratados antes de ser, retornar ao meio ambiente. Isso é muito importante nesse momento. Aqui falando, continuamos na biodiversidade, são 118 mil hectares preservados na companhia, isso representa mais de 31 milhões de toneladas de carbono estocado sob a gestão da, do empreendedor, sob a gestão da SLC Agrícola. Significa que tem gente cuidando, significa que nós temos lá quase 500 é, brigadistas que circulam, que evitam é, furtos de madeira, acesso indevido, etc., na nossa empresa. Então, é, não é uma coisa simples, é muita coisa, ali estão algumas referências para dar uma ideia do tamanho das nossas áreas. Ao mesmo tempo, dois projetos, dois pilotos que nós estamos in, implementando agora, de economia circular na companhia, e hoje a reciclabilidade nesses pilotos é de 68%. 
Sabemos que no Brasil a situação é mais complexa. Né? É pouca, pouco é reciclável, cerca de 20%, 30% reciclável. E na, no projeto a gente quer chegar a quase 100% de recicla, reciclabilidade nas fazendas Pamplona e Fazenda Planalto, que são os nossos projetos. Falando um pouquinho de, de agricultura regenerativa, nós estamos nesse caminho, estamos com essa agenda, ela faz parte do nosso processo, adubação verde, plantio direto, tá? a integração lavoura-pecuária, que já foi falado, rotação de culturas, manejo integrado de pragas e doenças, todo esse conjunto dinâmico faz parte da... Da, da agricultura regenerativa, que nós estamos caminhando a passos largos para ter bioinsumos, biofertilizantes, etc., que vão reduzir o impacto da nossa agricultura. Aqui, falando um pouquinho de stakeholders, falando um pouquinho dos investimentos em educação, da empresa que EJA é a educação de jovens e adultos, cresceu muito, nós estamos formando cidadãos educados dentro da companhia, cresceu aí significativamente, é um projeto muito importante da empresa, a no, o nosso clima organizacional também vem melhorando ao longo do tempo, com tratamento, qualidade de vida, e nós estamos aí com 84% de nível de satisfação na empresa. A redução do número de acidentes, vejam que nós plantávamos lá na safra 10-11, é, uma área de 343 mil hectares, e tínhamos 11 acidentes com afastamento por um milhão de horas trabalhadas. E a gente veio, mesmo aumentando a área nos últimos anos, crescendo e tendo o destino do acidente zero na SLC Agrícola. Estamos no caminho certo, mesmo com o aumento e incorporação de áreas, esse é um indicador extremamente importante. E para concluir aqui, o investimento feito na área social da empresa, 2,2 milhões de reais, através da nossa, do nosso meio, que é o Instituto SLC, fundado em 2020, e que atendeu aí 6 mil e e 20 pessoas, 180 toneladas de, de alimentos, de uma forma geral, 80 municípios. Está aqui a nossa ação nessa linha, é, da, fechando, então, o ISD com governança, com sustentabilidade e com o social. Bom, agora, para falar de resultados, eu chamo o diretor aí, o Ivo Brum, que é diretor financeiro e de relações com investidores. Boa tarde, Ivo. Bem Boa tarde. Obrigado, Álvaro. Boa tarde a todos, Obrigado. prazer estar aqui com vocês. Bom, falar de resultado, na prática, nós vamos falar de todas as ações que foram comentadas anteriormente. Né? Nós vamos falar do ILP, que adicionou valor para a companhia, utilizando o máximo possível dos ativos. Nós vamos falar da, da inovação, que trouxe mais eficiência, trouxe mais redução de custo. Né? Nós vamos falar de sementes, né? que agregou valor a um produto. E isso tudo aparece aqui no resultado da companhia. Né? Então, nosso, nossa receita líquida chegou a 4,3 bi, é um crescimento de 41%. Eu não vou mais falar em crescimento, porque todos os indicadores vão indicar isso. Tá? Crescimento. Mas o importante é lembrar o seguinte. Lugo bruto, 2,2 bi, com uma margem de 51%. Isso sim é representativo, uma margem realmente recorde para a companhia. Nosso lucro líquido chegou a 1 bi, 130 milhões, 26% de margem líquida, excepcional. Né? E nosso EBITDA ajustado chegou a 1 bi, 700 praticamente, com uma margem EBIT de 38,6%, praticamente 39%. Né? Ou seja, nós realmente chegamos em resultados excelentes. Né? A dívida subiu, subiu para 2.300, né? quase 2.400, mas fruto desse crescimento. Né? Não tem como crescer, não tem como demandar mais capital de giro e não ter uma, um pênalti em cima da dívida. Mas ainda assim, nós vamos ver ao longo da apresentação, essa relação dívida EBITDA está exatamente tá controlada. Bom, vamos falar um pouquinho do EBITDA ajustado. Né? Nós chegamos a um ponto... 1,7 bi de, 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 de margem EBIT, da NET de 39%, mas olha o nosso histórico, né? um histórico que vinha na faixa de 31%, 32%. O que quer dizer com isso aqui? O que eu quero mostrar para vocês? Que nesse período nós tivemos preços de grãos altos, preços de grãos baixos, algodão em preços máximos, mínimos, e nós ficamos com essa margem de 31% agora, com, né, com uma condição melhor de preço, principalmente, né? A margem de foi para 39%. Né? E promete muito para, ano, para o ano de 2022, que depois o Pablo Inato vai falar mais um pouquinho. Quando a gente olha o lucro líquido, que chegou a 1 bi 131 milhões, margem de 26%, olha o histórico. Né? Né? Nesse período nós tivemos secas também, tivemos períodos ótimos de clima, a nossa margem estava beirando os 20%. Né? E agora a gente vai para uma margem, para um outro patamar, 26% de margem, que é uma margem também excepcional. 
Aí a relação dívida EBITDA. Né? Ou seja, apesar de todo esse crescimento que foi importante para a companhia, que, né, que vai começar a reverter em resultado, né? porque o resultado da série plantada vai aparecer em 2022, a gente ficou com uma relação de dívida de 1,4%. Né, um, 1,42, que é, olha, no máximo que nós tínhamos em 2018. Então, ou seja, está completamente controlado e você sabe como é que funciona a agricultura, a gente paga na frente os fertilizantes, a gente paga na frente as sementes, e só vai depois ter o resultado, depois da colheita e quando começar a entregar o produto. Então, o final de 2022, nós vamos ter uma geração forte de caixa e com certeza esse indicador deve reduzir significativamente. Bom, o dividendo, que é um item importante né, para o nosso acionista, nosso dividendo yield, nos últimos anos, ele beirou a 5,7%. Esse último ano, especificamente, que nós vamos pagar 504 milhões, que ainda vai ser aprovado na Assembleia Geral, está beirando a 4,8% de dividendo yield. É um excelente dividendo yield, na minha visão. Né? Então, ou seja, nós estamos gerando resultados, gerando caixa e pagando... Né, Aqui vocês já começam a ter uma ideia de qual, quão forte vai vir o nosso resultado nesse ano de 2022. Né? E como o Pavinato comentou, esse ano a gente já, já entre, vai entregar soja no mesmo patamar de produtividade que o ano passado, e o milho promete ser uma produtividade maior, porque foi plantado numa época mais adequada. Então, assim, o um investidor que aplicou na SLC, lá na abertura de capital, um real hoje ele tem R$ 4,95. Isso significa que ele ganhou anualizado 12%, né? 12,1%. So 12,1% on an annualized basis. The CDI during this period would be 7,71. So we are delivering above CDI with a very interesting return rate. The appreciation of our assets, a very important item. I wouldn't say it lost value. It didn't lose value to the company. It's a star when we talk about debt negotiation for a number of collaterals. In 2007, it was worth 713 million reals. Today, the same portfolio is worth almost 3.9 billion, 3 .9 billion reals. And the total company portfolio, because we bought other assets during that period, is 6.9 billion reals. So we are generating cash, and we also have the appreciation of our assets that do not appear in our balance so clearly. So we have a CAGR of 13.5%, which is a very interesting number. This is the DAP profile, 25% short-term and 75% long-term, which gives us some comfort to renegotiate that and raise more money over the period. Well, it was easy to speak about the figures because they speak for themselves. I turn it over to Pavinato, who will speak about the future that motivates us so much. Pavinato, over to you. Very nice, Ivo, thank you so much. Thank you for the financial information. Let us go into our final round and then we're gonna have a Q&A. I just wanted to talk about the future that lies ahead. As I mentioned earlier on, our future is promising. I usually tell our team, we have three pillars that guide our activities, people, processes, and technologies. Processes and technologies, we are investing a lot and improving a lot, but on the pillar people, 
That's the most important one. When I look at all people indicators within SLC today, they are a lot better than they were some years back. And the people pillar with positive indicators, low turnover, high engagement level, low accident rates, very high satisfaction level. All of those are people indicators that show hours of training a year. These are indicators showing how mature the team is and how prepared we are for the future. And the preparation of the team guarantees the future. That's like that's why I like to reinforce how prepared we are to keep on growing, to keep on evolving in our efficiency. And as a result, we will increasing deliver increasingly better results for our shareholders. Let us now speak about the midterm, short to midterm. 2022 is in the bag. The crop is almost guaranteed on average for the three crops, 70% of our crops have been sold forward with a fixed interest rate. So we only have 30% to be sold, that 30% yet to be sold will benefit from higher prices. The cost has already been covered. So 2022, promises to be as good as 2021 as far as margins are concerned. As we grew 45% in our acreage, prices went up another 20 to 30%. Look at the growth potential that we have for revenue, EBITDA, and net profit for 2022. So 2022, once again, is a year where SLC will achieve record results. Now, 2023 will be a year where there will be a scenario of increased costs, as I mentioned before. But take a look at this table. The prices, we have already sold forward part of our production also for very good prices and the balance to be sold for commodities is higher than the prices we will pay for the inputs. So we expect all cost increases expected for the 22-23 season will be offset by price increases we will enjoy in our ag commodities. So 2022-2023, will give us very high margins. That's the scenario we are designing today. There is a discussion on input supplies. We can discuss that some more during our Q&A session, but we believe that we will be able to manage the input supply factors, ensuring appropriate execution of the 2022-2023 season still delivering excellent results to our shareholders. Based on the economic scenario I alluded to, based on how prepared our team is, we will continue working on our strategy. Our strategy is based on the four pillars I mentioned asset-like growth, looking for greater efficiency in our operations, consistent financial indicators and capital allocation for projects that generate more return and increasingly reinforcing our protagonism in ESG. This slide you see sort of summarizes what I said. 
And we are highly optimistic about the future because when we look at the demand side in the mid to long term, it's quite consistent. All indicators are favorable. The population will keep on growing. World GDP will keep on growing. The demand for biofuels will keep on growing and the population will increasingly migrate from rural to urban areas. For drivers that will determine demand growth, if there is demand, somebody will need to produce to meet that demand. Fortunately, Brazil is the best prepared country to meet that demand growth. And within Brazil, SLC is a company prepared to keep on growing and to meet that world demand. That's why we are optimistic about the future. Our team is prepared, our investment capacity is appropriate and demand is there. And we will work to evolve our operations, both in terms of growth in planted area, the diversification of businesses, also maximizing efficiency in our operations. Very well. We like to reinforce our big dream at SLC because this message says a lot. How can you impact future generations by being an example to that future generation? How do you want to become a reference in efficiency being one of the best operators in the market, respecting the planet, totally connected with ESG and sustainability. So we work to deliver the big dream SLC has for our stakeholders at every level. And we also work based on values. That's why we reinforce the four values of the company that very objectively summarize how as employees, we must behave. And if we do that, the company will be recognized for those values. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank our team for the preparation and for the presentations. And we now open for questions from our investors, analysts, and clarify whatever question you may have. Thank you so much. I invite my colleagues to join me on this stage so that we can answer questions that come in. Thank you very much, Eduardo, Pavinato, Alvaro, Ivo, and Federico for presenting all this relevant information about our company. Well, it is now time to begin the second part of our meeting. I'm going to ask Pavinato to remain here. Ivo is already here. We're going to open up for questions. There will be questions answered by WhatsApp and others that were sent through the screen here. Let me check. We have a first question from Tiago Duarte from BTG Pactual. Good afternoon, Tiago. Please go ahead, turn on your mic and ask your question. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Congratulations on this event. Two questions on my side. The first about the topic described by Pavinato. Two opportunities in the input market, especially fertilizers. You repeat something you had been saying since the input market showed a relevant inflation last year. You said that historically, due to the high prices of uh, fertilizers that destroyed demand. On the other hand, part of the discussion the market is having, it's not just a price and demand discussion, but also a discussion of availability of some of those inputs. I'd like to hear from you on those two points, if you understand that demand is retracting in Brazil and abroad because of prices, if demand is being reduced, and if besides price, 
do you envisage any product shortage in certain regions or in certain periods of time along the next uh, crop season and the one after that? And do you see any impact this may have on yield? Perhaps not for SLC, but on some smaller farmers in Brazil and abroad. I think that's a very important point. So that's my first question. The second one has to do with growth. This last year, even 2022, and the important component you call asset three, asset light investments focused on mature areas. You mentioned technology as a game changer. I'd like to hear you on what we can imagine about new growth drivers for the company, both in terms of replicating transactions like you had with Terra Santa and Zingu, how much bigger can that asset light model become after those two transactions? And also SLC seeds, because that's a project proving to be very interesting with a very high potential, as Pavinato mentioned, it's already a big business within SLC and how that can evolve not only within SLC, but possibly even considering a spin-off. So what do you think about that new growth trend? Thank you once again, that's it. Okay, Tiago, thank you very much for your two questions. On the fertilizers, up until the war with Ukraine, we had two variables, demand and price that was affecting demand. Now we have a third variable, supply, namely. So let us begin with the supply variable. The big discussion is, to what extent will Russia and Bielorussia will be able to send fertilizers to the country since they are net exporters, uh, Belarus rather, let us take nitrogen, 176 tons of uh, urea the world produce. Russia and Belarus produce 6% of that volume only, only 6%. If you talk about nitrate, where the world produces 20 million tons, they produce 50%. Ammonium sulfate, out of the 20 million the world produces, they produce only 1.6, in a nutshell. And nitrogen, Russia and Belarus produce about 10% of what the world produces. So that supply difficulty from Russia and Belarus will generate a lack of supply. No, because they only account for 10% of the world supply, quote unquote, only. If we take the second component, P, Phosphorus, out of the 87 million tons the world produces, Russia and Belarus also produce around 6% of that. So it's also a nutrient where there shouldn't be a lack of supply because of logistics problems caused by the war. The third one, K, potassium, we might have a problem out of the 66 million tons produced by the world, Russia and Belarus produce 36% and they account for 40% of exports. So not having potassium from Russia and Belarus means that indeed there's going to be a global shortage. Fortunately, CLC has acquired potassium for the next season, and uh, we believe that one year from now, 
which is before the next season, the war will be behind us and this problem will have been solved. So there is a problem today of global shortage, especially when you look at potassium. When you look at demand, then prices at the high levels that they are today historically is something that really affects demand. So how much they will affect demand? Well, it should be commensurate, commensurate with the reduction in, in supply. In 2018-19, was a 17% decrease in demand for fertilizers in the U.S. and in Brazil as well. So this year, because commodity prices are higher, it is likely that demand will not be so much affected, but it will be something in the range of 10 to 20 percent of uh, nitrogen. There'll be a rearrangement in the international market, and it is likely that uh, there'll be a, a balance in supply because demand will be lower. In the case of potassium, yes, the world depends on potassium from Russia and Belarus, so we expect the war not to be too long and then that they will be able to export potassium. Even if Russia wants to start to, to continue exporting, it's not being able to because of a number of challenges, but we expect that there won't be any effects on the 2022-2023 season. Well, prices were at a very high level, but they were on a downward trend, and everyone expected prices to go down over the year. And by the end of the year, prices will be, would be lower, but the wars changed everything. So prices are up once again, $1,000 per ton of each one of the nutrients and uh, is it going to be at 1,000 or go up to 1,200? It all depends on the war. If uh, if the war ends, uh, the prices might go down, and uh, the prices may increase if the war doesn't win. So, so is is it going to affect yields? Well, our strategy is to reduce the use of fertilizers by 20 to 25 percent without affecting yield, because in the past few years, we've been evolving our crops. But in Brazil as well, you see that there's been an expansion in uh, five, seven percent of uh, area and uh, is increased the use of fertilizers by 20, 25 percent. So we've grown our stock. So in the first year, I don't think that's going to be significant drop in yield because of the shortage of fertilizers. In temperate countries, the soil is usually very fertile. And if you don't use potassium and phosphorus for one year, it's not a problem. That's not the case of nitrogen, which is not for soybean, but, but corn and cotton. So we depend on nitrogen every year. So this is the main challenge, I think, this year. We need adequate supply of nitrogen. Of course, in the United States, they might be growing, planting less corn and a bit more soybean because of the high fertilizer price. And the nitrogen fertilizer industry is large and diversified. So any adjustments in the cost of natural gas, the industry can respond very quickly and increase its supply because the natural gas price today is what's driving the cost of nitrogen up and prices are up and costs are up as well. So nitrogen is maybe the nutrient that is the most challenging one for us because of its production cost and potassium in terms of its supply uh, capacity. So this is the challenge we needed to manage in, in this next season in Brazil. And you also asked about the company's growth. 
about consolidation is a possibility. Our business model is replicable. We have today 22 farms. We could have 25, 26 or 30 farms. So yes, we could grow. Of course, this will happen depending on the opportunities we see in the marketplace. Diversification, as you mentioned. So indeed, our seed project is diversification. We are investing, we'll go on investing that. Also, the crop and livestock farming project is another project that can be expanded and we can create more value there. And a diversification of other businesses and crops is always possible. Today, we are a food production company and we have to be attentive to the opportunities in the food industry globally. So discussion of fruits could be an opportunity, but these are strategic projects that will be considered as opportunities come up. So if you have financial capacity to grow, you can make the most out of the opportunities. And that's been the case. We've been, we, we have financial capacity and uh, this is not a linear project. You don't grow the same every year. You might grow more this year and the next year don't grow as much. But the, the most important thing, thing is to look at the movie and not at the picture. So this is the idea. We want to go on growing in the near future. Thank you, Pavinato. Now, Victor Sarajoto from Credit Suisse wants to ask, ask the next question. So hello, Victor. You can ask your question now. Hello and uh, and thank you and uh, congratulations for this meeting and congratulations for your performance. I have two questions as well. The first is also about, about growth. We see other companies in, in related agribusiness sectors and they start to diversify their business going beyond just crop. So I'd like to know from you if this is something that you consider. So diversifying your business may be into complementary businesses, such as, for instance, transportation and storage, where there are some opportunities in the market. And my second question, is when we look at value creation with acquisition and transformation of land, very important. We see that, that as SLC has been reducing the percentage of its own areas regarding, uh, when you look at the total planted area. So given cash generation and opportunities we see in, in some regions in Brazil, when we look at land prices, don't you think you could speed up the acquisition of land for transformation and also real estate profit? Thank you. Well, thank you, Victor, for your questions. When it comes to new projects, uh, we focus more today on innovation than on uh, traditional businesses. So growing in the traditional businesses that require heavy investments is not part of our primary scope. Today, as we saw in Frederico's presentation, we want with SLC Ventures, for instance, to find solutions and uh, work on our strategy of uh, building the businesses of the future. And uh, the businesses of the future might not be the same as the businesses of the past in the agribusiness industry. So this is our mindset today. We focus on innovation and uh, wanted to capture value within the agribusiness industry, but investing in innovative projects and businesses. And uh, we might have changes in our business model in the future when we compare to our business model today. 
Now your second question about investments in land. We've invested heavily in, in, in land over the years. We bought a lot of land when it was cheap, then we stopped, and then we just sold two or three properties just to show how valuable those they were. Today we have two-thirds of our own land and one-third leased. And uh, in the past few years we've been leasing a lot and it's diluted our land portfolio. So we think that land price appreciation will create value for the company in, in the future. So just uh, as you mentioned, if there are opportunities, we consider the opportunity of uh, buying land opportunistically actually and adding that to our portfolio and then also create value, value through land appreciation. So conversion of pasture, yes, but no conversion of uh, native forests. Uh, we, we told the market that we will no longer work in areas where you find today native forests. We are going to be working in material areas or pasture area that can be converted to crop. So our idea is that having our share of owned land is convenient and uh, brings more stability to our business. So in the future, in addition to growing by lease, we also consider grow, growing by acquiring land. Thank you, Pavinato. The next question is going to be asked by Guilherme Polaris of Bank of America. Hello, you can uh, uh, unmute your mic and ask your question. Good afternoon, everyone. We have two quick questions. We've been discussing the fertilizer landscape. I have two questions to follow up on Tiago's. The first is if you could give us more details regarding egg chemicals, because you've been telling us about fertilizers, but how do you see process and availability of egg chemicals? And when you look at inputs in general, how are you planning the crops for the next season and how do they affect your plan in terms of how much you're going to be growing of each of the crops? Or egg chemicals? Well, it's the uh, supply is also challenging because of the pandemic and not of the war now. And uh, all of the problems in a supply chain and uh, there's still problems in, of the industry supplying the demand of uh, egg chemicals. We've uh, acquired 60% of the egg chemicals we need. So we believe we will ensure the supply of our operations for the next season. And they are more expensive. Of course, prices are higher than they were before. And so the next season, it's going to be more expensive than this year. So there's going to be an increase in egg chemical costs in addition to fertilizer costs. But the egg chemical industry is working hard to be able to increase the supply. This year has been very challenging, but the industry is, well, we've been able to plant and harvest. So uh, it, it was hard, but we managed to get what we needed in time for the operation. So the supply challenges didn't have much of a negative effect. And I think next year is going to be similar. It's going to be challenges and shortages, but uh, the egg chemical industry is going to be able to deliver input in time for planting. Now, changing in, uh, changes in crops. As I mentioned before, crops that require more egg chemicals and more fertilizers, what I think is that there won't be any increases, cotton, or corn, soybean is the crop that least demand in fertilizers, just phosphorus and potassium. You don't need to use nitrogen. And also soybeans don't require so much egg chemicals in terms of insecticides, fungicides. For soybean would be the favorite crop this year if you consider input shortage. So that's why we think that uh, United States growers will be planting more soybeans and, and in Argentina as well. 
Brazil cotton is is a second season for us, so it's we're going to be planting as as much soybeans as we can. Maybe we won't be expanding cotton areas because of this uh, shortage in input. In our case, our strategy is to maintain our portfolio, the same cotton volume and the same soybean volume. So this is our strategy. Was there another question? No, right? Okay. okay. Now, Renan Moura from Ito is going to ask a question. So, Renan, you can ask your question now. Hello, everyone. Congratulations on this meeting and on the, your performance. I have two questions as well. The first is about your Q4 results. We saw the use of working capital, especially in Q4, which is different from, from what we had seen before. So I'd like to ask a question about working capital seasonability going forward and what was last year different. So this is the first question. The second question is about Russia, Ukraine and fertilizer availability. What do you think regarding the use of biologic fertilizers? Would you would that help you protect against the shortage of fertilizers, or do you think that there's no sufficient supply of biologics? These are my two questions. Thank you, Renan. So let me answer a question about working capital. Q4 historically is when we mostly generate cash. And uh, last year was an exception. And there's a reason for that. We ended the year at, with 130 million in cash, which is low. Usually we close the year with 900 million, 1 billion, because that's when you, we're selling our cotton harvest, which is the one that creates more value. And why is it that we had lower lower cash? Because we paid our January and February suppliers early. We have a covenant that ends in 2024-25 that the relation between total asset and, and net equity cannot be higher than 2.5x. So without the price volatility of the commodities and uh, our NDFs were, tell, were telling us that we were having losses. Of course, we sold cotton at 80 cents and, and the market was paying 1.20. So at 80, we're, we were profitable, but there was a 40 cent loss in that transaction. The same would go to LDFs. We would sell US dollars at five and uh, the dollar was at 5.50. And so we have the, this liability in derivatives. And uh, the counterpart is the net equity. And we have hedge accounting. So our indicators of total liabilities over net equity was around 2.45 and 2.50. And we wanted to take this chance of waiting the results to be audited to be sure whether or not we would have problems with the indicators. So we did two things. First, we got in touch with the banks and we got a waiver. From, for all of the transactions that were open in our balance on, on December 31st. But also we wanted to comply with a covenant when we had 1 billion cash. So in December, we prepaid 128 million to suppliers. So payments that would come due in January, February. So that's why we had the, the performance in working capital and leases as well. So yeah. The long term, yes, for the long term, yes, 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 of course, yes, and increasing liability, yes. There was a significant gro growth in liability because the Terra Centra transaction means increase in leases, a 20 year leases, but it's a 2 million railway in liability. So still, it was working fine. When we did the Terra Centra transaction, that was in the radar screen. But then what was not on our radar screen was the derivative. So we decided not to take a chance. We did the prepayments. And fortunately, we had the 2.45 indicator. And now January and February, because 
we've paid all of the suppliers, we are going to recompose the cash. And the second question about biologic fertilizers. Well, there's biologic biologic chemicals that uses that help us for instance with caterpillars stink bugs when we have been we're reducing the use of chemicals of well, biological fertilizers are the organic fertilizers and what's an organic fertilizer is there organic matter from your fields and that you use that in your meat production and that comes back as a residue or else organic residue that you recycled and turned into organic fertilizer. So my answer to you is that biologic fertilizers is a complex topic. And uh, it's difficult to supply all of the farmers in it would be difficult to have enough supply of organic fertilizers. Let's look at potassium, for instance, to illustrate. Each soybean bean ton that I sell to China includes with it 20 to 22 kilograms of K2O, potassium that comes out of the ground. And I have to replace that potassium. So using organic fertilizers is not enough because they have 5% potassium content. And then I, if I use 1000 kilograms of organic fertilizer per hectare, it's going to be 50 kilograms of potassium. And then I plant soybeans and produce four tons per hectare. It means that I will be exporting 85 kilograms of potassium per hectare to whoever buys my soybeans. So organic fertilizers work for organic agriculture and that's a market niche. It doesn't work for the egg business in terms of its scale and it's in, in, in because of its demand. I, I need to replace soil nutrients using concentrated products. And those are the chemical fertilizers. I'm unable to replenish my soil using organic fertilizer, unless I had such a perfect chain that I would be able to replace 100% of what I about So 100% of uh, manure from uh, from pigs and from cattle and uh, from poultry and human beings as well. And human beings as well. Everything would have to go back into the fields so as so that I would be able to have a balanced system. Thank you, Pavinato. Next question is going to be asked by Gabriel Baja from Citibank. Thank you. Hello, Gabriel. You can ask your question. Well, thank you for the presentation. I might be a bit repetitive, but I'll be asking about something which I think is very important. This next season, correct me if I'm wrong, but 2021, when you look at costs, well, it's a given, all right? You have a, a big upside because you're at, of your hedging operations. Up until two or three months ago, the scenario was completely different for ag commodities. But when you look at 22-23, I don't know about this balance between commodity prices and the production costs. So I know that your strategy is uh, focused on return on cost, your CAPEX. But in a high volatility of commodity price scenario, are you going to change your strategy? If you look at the hedging transactions compared year by year, there's, there's been no big differences if you look 
one year ahead. So how do you see this uh, scenario of uncertainties? This is the first question. The second question, when you talk about fertilizers, I think an important point is that for better or worse, the soil is a nutrient bank. And you showed a graph showing SLC's soil maturity and comparing that to the new areas being grown in Brazil. And so, in theory, your, your soil is better than competitors. You said that 20-25% decrease in use of fertilizers wouldn't affect your yield. And uh, how do you see your competitors? I've heard 5 or 10%. Do you agree with that? With that? And do you see that as a hedge when you look at the next crop and when you look at your competitors? These are my two questions. Well, thank you, Gabriel. Your question about fertilizer use. Yes, you're right. Our soils are mature. We, we grow cotton, very fertile soil. We can use less fertilizers. We can grow soybeans and without any decrease in yield. So that's why I said 20 to 25 percent reduction. In the industry is going to reduce 10 to 20 percent. The average of the industry. Well, yesterday we were discussing this. So maybe the reduction is going to be greater because of a shortage in supply. So growers will have to use less fertilizers than they would like to because of the shortage. Now, well, this is a challenge when you think about expanding planted areas because when you go into new land, usually it's a low fertility soil. So if uh, in times of shortage, it might not be convenient to plant into new areas. So, so that limits supply. And because of that, prices tend to be to maintain on a high level. I don't know if I understand your question about hedging. Today, we are more hedged for 2023 in terms of uh, input than in commodity prices. So it, that's positive today because commodity prices are high at the spot market and the futures, future prices are lower. Recently, the future prices have, have gone up. So if we sell today, we are selling at, a, at better prices than one month ago. And uh, we've, if we wait a bit longer, it is likely that we will be selling cotton at better prices than one month ago. We sold at 84, 85 cents one month ago, maybe today, we might get 87 and soon 90. So having this uh, input hedging ahead of commodity hedges, so it's, being, it's good in a year like this. We look at both together because commodity revenue is 100 and our cost is not 100, it's 60 or 70. So percentage wise, Input hedging is ahead of commodity prices. In absolute values, that's not the case. Both go hand in hand. So in fixed prices for input and commodities. So we are hedged for input and commodity for 22, 23. And we have a commodity volume available to be sold at better prices than because we think there will be better prices for commodities because of shortage in commodity supply and the future prices. Well, $14 is the future price for soybean next year. Spot price is 17. So is next year the price to be, to be, going to be 14 or 15? Maybe it's 15 next year. And the same goes to cotton. And the spot price is 120. And the future price for December 2023 is 83 cents today. So one year from now, the spot price, what's, what is it going to be? 100? 95, great, much better than the current price if you think about the future. So this is why our scenario for 2023, there's many uncertainties yet. A lot will happen before that, but we think we'll be able to offset the increase in costs with the increase in prices and still have good margins. This is 
our estimate. Of course, things might change over the way, but this is what we think will happen. Three months ago, we were more pessimistic. We thought that input prices were high and the prices were on a downward trend. So I have 2.5 and 12.5 prospectors. But that, that's completely changed today because of the drought in southern Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. That's completely changed the supply of grains and led to a change in prices. And then there's the war. The war is a short-term element. Oh, obviously, if the war stops, that upside might come back. The upside of the war is from 15 to 17. The 14 to 15 is the drought from 15 to 17 dollars a bushel is because of the war. The same thing for corn, 5.5, 6 dollars was drought from 6 to 7 was the war. So that upside for the war might stop as soon as the uh, war stops. So in the midterm, we believe that the 2023 prices should be higher than they are today. The prices for 2023 today are not so high as the spot prices. If you could remind us, at the same time of the year, last season, how much nitrogen fertilizer had you bought? The same level or more? We hadn't bought anything last year. This year, we bought more than normally. We usually start negotiating in March. We've already bought 60%, but usually we start negotiating in March and conclude in April, May, or June, just like fertilizers. Nitrogen, we normally buy in May, June, and July. And our expectation this year was to buy at the same period. Had it been the war, prices would come down even more. It had dropped from 800 to 500, but the war came and changed the scenario. And nitrogen, well, we start receiving potassium now and we apply it in between seasons. The same thing for phosphorus. We will apply it in June, July, August, September between the two crops. Nitrogen is applied post planting. We apply it after we plant cotton. In the case of corn, we plant corn in February and we apply uh, nitrogen in February or March. So we start using nitrogen in November and we use it until April last year, next year. We may buy part of the fertilizer to apply November, December, and we could buy part of it at the end of the year to use in February, March or April. We could possibly wait to see how the war evolves, how prices and supply evolve. Thank you, Pavinato. Next question comes from Mari Silva from Bank of Brazil. Hello, Mari. Please turn on your mic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations on your results. I'd like to go back to crop livestock farming. With the significant results you had from your cattle, what is the potential growth of that segment and the strategy not only for this year, but also for the future ones, considering the improvement in the cattle cycle and how important can that be in the company? Second, about logistics. How do you see the potential impact on volumes because of lower availability of vessels and containers? We had shortage and high prices before the war. How much worse did the war make it for cattle? We are learning to work with cattle. We created a team, veterinarians, professionals working on animal husbandry. We are increasing the number of head per year. Last year was 28,000 head. This year we'll get to 34,000 head. We have a potential to get to 100,000 head. What is 100,000 head? The price today is 5,000 reals of revenue per head. 
So the cattle business can get to 500, 600 million of revenue over the next few years. And that might be the potential in terms of business size for cattle. On logistics, what in fact what was impacted the most was the shipping of cotton due to the lack of containers and the price of containers. Logistics is normalized in January, February, we exported a lot of cotton. So we believe that over 2022, logistics will normalize and we won't have problems exporting our cotton. We are exporting the balance of last year's crop. We will conclude until June and we will export the volume we planted in the second half of this year. Very well, Pavinato. We received two questions via WhatsApp, both to Ivo. First from João Carlos Schur. Could you talk about your indebtedness, if there is cash, where will you invest? Thank you for your question. Well, traditionally, 50% of the company's results are paid as dividends. And whenever we see that our shares are low, we open a buyback program. We have a buyback program of 2 million that will be concluded soon. The remainder over the year, there will be increase in our need for working capital because we have to pay suppliers and we will harvest in the middle of the year. So the second half of the year generates a lot of cash. Our leveraging today is 1.7 times. It will be closer to one than to 1 1.5 because of cash generation all the money coming from the planted area and the corn will yield more than last year. So cash generation will be very strong and there will be a new challenge. With, an, with our EBITDA, the pressure from the board is we need to grow. Whenever the debt to EBITDA ratio goes above two, we should stop growing. But when it's close to one, there is pressure for us to resume growth. Thank you, Ivo. One more question from WhatsApp from Maria Reis. Do you expect to pay additional dividends if the board doesn't find new projects or if the management doesn't find new projects, we might pay additional dividends because the board won't allow us to be sub-leveraged. Below one would be sub-leveraging. If we don't have new projects that is profitable for the company generating value, possibly we might have additional dividend pay payouts. Thank you, Ivo. Next, coming from Wagner from Quantitas. Good afternoon, Wagner. Turn on your mic. Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations for your presentations and results. I have two questions. First, since you had two thirds of leased land and you increased the volume of leased land because of return, can we expect more investment in owned land that one third, two third ratio will continue, or can we expect you to buy more land? And in which geographies will you grow? Will you grow in existing areas or in new geographies? Another question, Pavinato. Fruit, I imagine that that project had a given size. The company grew a lot in the past two years. The size of that project, I imagine, is smaller than you originally thought. Have you mapped assets if you enter the fruit market? Do you think it will be important 
for the company. Thank you for the questions. Our expansion will take place in similar geographies. Today, we are present in seven states in the Brazilian Cerrado. So we are basically in every state in the Cerrado where we have annual crops. So expansion will take place in those regions. In every place where we are, we are talking about good regions and we have timely diversification for our business. The climate in the Cerrado is very stable, one of the best in the world. But even so, being in Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, Bahia, Maranhão, Piauí, and Minas Gerais, that diversity gives us fantastic stability in a year such as this. It grew a lot during harvest in Mato Grosso. It was wonderful in Mato Grosso do Sul. We had a record crop. We are harvesting a record crop in Bahia. The diversification we have today is fantastic and it's likely to continue. So we will expand in the same geographies. As for fruit, or fruits rather, the company has now a different size. And any new project should be big enough to change the needle in our compacts. Compass. So we have to think about larger projects. There is no rush. We have a long-term vision. Not always does the project happen in the year you expect it. So our management is working to make it feasible at a reasonable size that would warrant the project. There is no point creating a small project because it generates distraction rather than generating important results. So you will maintain the one third, two third ratio of owned and leased land. I, I'd say it's appropriate. We will buy some pieces of land to maintain that ratio. But if it goes up a little, the volume of leased land as compared to owned land, it's okay. It's important to have leased land with high yield potential in competitive regions where we can pay the lease and generate excellent results to our shareholders. We don't accept the idea of leasing land in marginal areas, not so productive areas, because in a moment of crisis, that's the area that suffers the most. If you have to pay the lease, cash generation will be used to pay the lease and there are no resources left for the operator. If we can grow leasing a lot, we will do it, even if that changes that one third to two third ratio, but buying land to maintain that ratio is also convenient. Thank you. Thank you, Pavinato. One more question via WhatsApp from Rodrigo. Thinking about synergies about your internal research and development and the investments in venture capital. Do you intend to sell solutions that are developed, tested and validated internally through agro or other companies you invest in? Can this be a new growth factor for the company in the long term? Certainly. SLC Ventures and SLC Builder has that bias to keep an eye on investment opportunities and development opportunities. And why not one day turn that into a business? Will that happen? I don't know. We see that we must invest in this area. Will we create a viable product? I don't know. Agribusiness will undergo important changes over the years. Important changes in terms of management. You know that there is management outside the, the farm gates and complex management within the farm gates. Outside the farm gates, the market is more organized and more concentrated. So we intend to work strongly 
with that vision of innovation to see what can be done differently management wise thinking in the long term and thinking about where or how the world will evolve and how ag operations will evolve in the mid to the long term that's why our innovation team has that focus thank you pavinaro one more question from luana via whatsapp what are the best options in the market in terms of that thinking about financial costs currently for the company thank you luana for the question well the company is a safe haven to banks in times of crisis we always have the opportunity of having good transactions with low costs a transaction is a bilateral negotiation with the banks the rates are good we also have the choice of creating a cra which is a long-term process also on our radar screen and there is an array of debts in dollars that's also an option the dollar at the current level we might raise money in dollars ifc is knocking on our doors so we have alternatives resources are not a problem i can assure you thank you Ivo. we have one last question sent via whatsapp by Vicente Santos. The question goes to Pavinato. In one sentence, what do you believe defines the success at SLC? A success culture. In one sentence, that success culture is developed. So you must have that culture of success to be successful in your operation. Thank you, Pavinato. Well, Undoubtedly, it's been a very special afternoon to us all, but we must come to an end. Thank you very much for joining us today and for your participation. I'd like to remind you that the questions that were not answered today will be answered by email by our investor relations area. Thank you very much and hope to see you next time.